Thanks very much, Roland. Um, tonight, the story that I've got to talk to you about is an investment in oil and gas in uh, Trinidad. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the history of Trinidad, uh, how we got there, and why we think it's a great opportunity, especially in the rising oil and gas uh, cycle that I think we're heading into right now. And I'm, I'm sure I'll have the question of where do I think oil prices are going to go. Um, and I will, uh, I'll give you what is purely my guess on that, um, if you want to know that later. Uh, along uh, with myself today, I also have Tom Valentine here in the front, who's one of our, uh, our directors. Tom's a lawyer at Norton Rose and is currently in London uh, teaching a course on LNG and uh, natural gas projects. So if you've got any good LNG questions, you can corner him afterwards. He's, he's somewhat of a world authority on that. So great to have Tom along today. So what, we, uh, what our goal is in Trinidad is to become the most profitable, and I put that as the emphasis as opposed to large, being big but not being profitable uh, isn't going to work long term for us. So the key thing for us is to be the most profitable oil and gas company in Trinidad onshore, and I'll walk you through that. This is a disclaimer. Roland made it sound much better than if you have to read this, so we'll go with Roland's version uh, on this. So Touchstone itself, um, it's an international gas company. It's solely in, in Trinidad. Uh, we're actually uh, trade on both AIM and the Toronto Stock Exchange under the uh, trading symbol TXP. Um, it's a seven-year story, although it's a new story on AIM. We listed in June of this year. It's a story that's been around for seven years, and I'll just give you a little history of that. We started at 143 barrels a day of oil production, and we're currently at about 1,500 barrels a day. So over that seven-year period, we've grown about tenfold. And uh, quite frankly, our target um, over the next same period of time will be to somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 barrels a day. Um, we, we've drilled four wells this year, and, and they were really, really important. It's the first time we had drilled some wells in a couple of years as the oil price came back up, and we're going to do recompletions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and what we want to do is then expand the program in the next little while and move that program up to 10 wells. A little bit of my history. This is the third public oil and gas company um, that I've been involved in, and they all are put together on the same basis. Try to find a small producing asset that has big oil or big gas with, uh, that hasn't had technology applied to it yet. And then what we do is we go ahead and apply technology. Uh, the first one was uh, a little company called Remington Energy. It was about 150 barrels a day when we started it. And it was about 28,000 barrels a day and about a $400 million market cap when we sold it. Uh, True Energy was uh, similar, about 350 barrels a day, about 20,000 barrels a day when we, when we sold it. And we kind of split it up into two other companies when we did that. And uh, quite frankly, I'd love to do the same thing again with Touchstone. It's been a little more challenging with uh, oil price going to $28, but I think we're coming out of that cycle now where you're going to see some of these micro cap uh, oil and gas companies really grow over the next four or five years, uh, especially with the, the larger caps having cut all of their capex. It's going to be some great opportunities for the smaller oil and gas companies around the world. Scott Budow came from the um, service side of the business. This is really his first time in the role of CFO, but he's... He's uh, one, of the smartest, one of the smartest guys I've worked with and, and really been great, especially getting us listed on AIM. James Shipka, I've worked with him a long time. His last role, he was managing about 24,000 barrels a day, so he's very capable of what we're doing. All the directors on the bottom there, um, you can take a look at in the, in the presentation. So our approach is what I talked about a little bit. It's, it's we're not an exploration company looking for oil. Uh, we've gone to Trinidad because it has one of the largest oil deposits. It's in the Venezuelan basin, which is the largest oil deposit in the world, bigger than Saudi Arabia, and Trinidad sits on the up-dip end of that basin. So what we really want to do is go into where fields have already been discovered and uh, fine-tune them and really crank them up. So it's not an exploration play. It's more of a development play, although I will talk to you about some exploration. So why Trinidad? Uh, how did we end up here? So Trinidad itself, as I say, is right on the up-dip end of the Venezuelan basin. You can see that in the illustration up in the top corner there. Um, but Trinidad itself is uh, a Caribbean island that is like no Caribbean island you've ever seen or imagined. Um, this isn't one of big sandy beaches and windsurfers and all those great things. This is a very, very industrialized island. Um, it, it became independent in 1962. Um, it has the world's largest ammonium plant on the island. It has a very large methanol plant. It is the sixth largest producer of liquid natural gas in the world. Um, it has a refinery that does about 150,000 barrels a day. 
and uh, supplies all of the jet fuel for the Caribbean. This is one industrial island when you think about it, like it's not a Caribbean uh, paradise. It sits right off the coast of Venezuela. Venezuela is about 11 kilometers to the south of here. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of unique. Having said all of that, the first production in Trinidad was in 1908. So it has been producing for over 100 years. It's very friendly on the oil and gas side of the world, and it's a great place to do business. Um, all the big guys operate there offshore to the north mainly, uh, liquid natural gas, and then all the services are there. So it's a wonderful place uh, from that point of view. So what we did, and just give you a little history, in 2010 we went in and bought a little company, 143 barrels a day, and uh, we identified five drilling locations. Um, and since then what we've done is five property acquisitions. We've drilled 40 wells, we've done 161 recompletions. So in 2017, you can sign to see the office in the top that we started with, and, and that's after a really good paint job. It didn't look anything like that when we started. Uh, to where we now have a staff of about 198 people, or sorry, 98 people on the ground. Um, we operate over 1,000 well bores. Um, we've got five or six operations going on every day. Um, this is a real operation now in, in what we do. Having said that, we think the capability of the staff and the operation is three or four-fold um, what we've got in place right now. Gives you a good idea what the compound looks like. And that guy's not running, actually. The video was too slow, so he's actually walking. He looks like he's running because we sped the video up so you can see it. Um, so where were we in uh, 2010? We had one property, uh, and it was 143 barrels a day. It was about 100 well bores, and it was about 650 acres, very small from the worldwide side of things. And then in, uh, as we progressed along, we did these five acquisitions, uh, bringing in different properties, drilling some different additional wells. Uh, the main focus initially was down in that southwest corner where you're seeing a lot of those orange blocks. So the orange blocks are producing blocks that we have. The yellow blocks are non-producing that will be in our drilling program in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, we are now the single largest onshore landowner in Trinidad. We have the largest uh, position. Some of the other companies that you'll hear about are Trinity, Columbus, Range. Uh, those are our competitors down here. Um, they have anywhere from one to four blocks. Uh, as I say, we're sitting with 20 blocks and 11 of those are producing. So we've now taken it from uh, roughly 2 million barrels a day in reserve, or 2 million barrels in reserves to 20 million barrels in reserves and current production of 1,500. So, um, when we take a look at the reserves, what we've done is we've really over the first six years of the company or seven years, we've been accumulating these assets. What we now need to do is convert those assets into cash flow. And that's, uh, that's what we started to do. That's why we wanted to list on AIM in June, was to get more liquidity. We raised some capital. Now we can get back in the field and drill a bunch of wells. So, um, as I mentioned, we got the 11 properties. And uh, uh, when we listed on AIM, Back in June, we said the one thing we wanted to do was go drill some wells and prove to everybody we could do what we, could do, what we said we would do. And what you can basically see is we took the production from about 1,250 to over 1,500 barrels a day just by drilling four wells. So we had about a 40% increase in our production. What we want to do is drill 10 more wells this coming year and just keep that orange bar moving north. Uh, that should take us through to about 23 to 2,500 barrels a day sometime in 2018. So um, about a 70% growth. This gives you an idea of the kind of area that we're working in. This video is a little bit choppy, I apologize for that, but it, very modern equipment on the island in Trinidad. Um, this is uh, state-of-the-art um, equipment that we're using, but the real advantage is it's inexpensive. So you'll hear a lot of discussion of oil and gas companies where they're spending millions of dollars drilling wells. Uh, our wells are just under a million dollars per well. Um, when we came to the market back in, uh, in, in June, so we were here in April and May, uh, we said we were going to drill four wells, and the green line that you see across the bottom there is what we anticipated the production from those four wells combined would be. It would sort of peak at 200 barrels a day, and it would sort of level out somewhere around 190, 180 barrels a day. We drilled the wells, and they came on much better than we anticipated, and even after five months, they're still 50% better than what we had thought. They're about 300 barrels a day combined. So what we want to do is take that exact same model we did on the first four wells, and drill 10, 10 more wells. When I say 10 more wells, that's in the first half of 2018. What we'd like to do is keep drilling 10 wells every six months. Um, that's the way this rolls out. We have 208 <coughs> drilling locations. So if you think about 20 wells a year, we're looking at roughly a 10-year inventory of drilling. Um, so we just 
crank it up and away we go. It, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a manufacturing process. But having said that, I just want to talk about the, the exploration part that we're doing. So in Trinidad, historically, the wells have only been able to drill to about 6,000 feet because the rig didn't have enough capacity. The new rig that's in country, we can take to 8,000, 10,000 feet. So the last four wells, we actually drilled them deeper. And in each one of those cases, we encountered zones deeper down. So the real advantage for us in Trinidad is we can drill deeper, look for exploration deeper. And if it doesn't work, we just move up hole and do development. So it's very, very low risk on that point of view. You're not going to drill a dry hole in southern Trinidad. The question is, is are you going to get a 20 barrel a day well, or are you going to get a 200 barrel a day well? That's the, that's the issue for us. So uh, what is our plan here? Um, uh, we want to drill a bunch of these wells, and we've got this really interesting thing that's set up right now in the oil and gas business around the world. We have oil prices that have gone up from $45 to $60, and we got still the service companies that haven't caught up to that lag. So services are still continuing to go down in price because there's no activity, nobody's spending capital. So what you can see here is the wells that we were drilling in 2014 were costing us about a million five. Uh, the last wells we just drilled are just over a million, and we just went out for bid for 10 more wells, and they came in at 800,000. So we're seeing oil prices go up, we're seeing service costs come down. It's part of the reason why my pitch to the board, glad Tom's here tonight so I can pitch him. Um, pitch to the board is let's get at it, let's drill as many wells as we can, uh, in the next six to nine months while we've got this uh, disconnection between service costs and where oil prices are at. It's an opportunity I've only seen twice before in my career, and it's both times coming out the backside of a cycle. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, some of the wells are shallower, that's why they're cheaper, so that's why we like to look at the, the graph on the right-hand side here, which is how much it costs you to drill per foot. And uh, what we're seeing here is you can see those prices are going down. So. Bottom line, drill them cheaper, get more production out of them, you make more money. It's really kind of simple for us. Um, as far as the wells go, uh, just to give you a, a quick look at economics, I said we've got 208 locations. In our business, you have to get auditors in to audit your reserves, not only your accounting, but they also audit your reserves. So the engineers come in and audit the reserves. And what we told them to do was put 52 wells in the, uh, in the asset base. And basically what you can see is if you invest $40 million, you get $62 million of value out of it. So it's a pretty decent rate of return. Um, this was based on $50 oil. These are old numbers from last year. If we were to run these at $60, we're going to see two things. The capital will go down because the wells have cost less, and the bottom line will go up because the oil price has gone up. Um, base production uh, and, and recompletion. So the other thing that we do besides drilling wells is in Trinidad, there's 10,000 wells that have been drilled on shore since 1908. Um, of those 10,000 wells, there's only about 1,400 of them that are producing. So you've got all these old well bores that are standing around uh, not doing anything. So the deal we have with the Trinidad government is we have the ability to go into the old well bores and recomplete them. And so that's what the team does. So it saves us drilling a well. We just go in. And what we do is we run some new technology from Slumberger. Uh, we just run it down the well, and it tells us where there's sands and oil that's been missed. We go down with a gun, we blow holes in the pipe, and these wells come back on production. We do two of those a month. Um, they are by far the most economic that we do. Um, it's just they don't add a lot. Like a, a new well will add 70 to 100 barrels a day. One of these recompletions will only add about 10 barrels a day. But the most economic thing I've ever seen in 25 years in the business um, in what we're doing down there. So on the recompletion costs, this gives you a really good idea. Um, if we spend $3.5 million on recompletions, you add $30 million in value. So um, from an economic point of view, we do as many of these as we can. It's just logistically, it's only two or three a month. So it's a pretty simple business for us. We drill wells and we recomplete them in Trinidad. We sell the oil to the refinery and we get paid on the 25th of the following month. It's that simple um, in the business. Uh, so the highlights for uh, Q3, so because we're a Toronto company, we report every quarter um, as opposed to just being a name company that reports twice a year. So we just put out our, our Q3 numbers. Um, and even with the lower prices, we still cash flowed $1.4 million. Um, and so our, our run rate on the cash flow right now, we're generating roughly $6 million a year. Uh, that'll go up dramatically as we drill these, these wells. But I think what's more important with all the cost reductions that we've done, what you can see is the net backs are going up. So we're actually making almost $25 a barrel now on, a, on an oil price of $59. So I, I think that's really key. We currently sit with about $7 million of cash on our balance sheet. 
Um, so we're cashed up pretty well. Um, so you got seven million of cash plus the cash flow coming in for funding the program. Uh, I'll be right honest with you that um, part of our reason for listing on AIM was we want to be able to access the capital markets and um, we really like to be able to ramp up that program as we go along. So, you know, don't be surprised if sometime down the road we raise a little more money so that we can drill more wells during this disconnect between service prices and, and oil prices. Um, what we're doing. Uh, so the other thing that we do down there is we're trying to take some of the world's best practices and apply them um, to Trinidad. It, it's, it's, been, it's been producing for 100 years, but I, I can honestly say there were some things that I was shocked at when I got down there. Um, one of them on the environmental side was that all of the water that's produced, when you produce oil, you also produce water. Uh, you separate the oil and the water uh, through a facility and pretty well everywhere else in the world except for maybe Russia. Um, you take that water and you re-inject it back into the reservoir. You don't want it to go to the environment. It's got chemicals in it. It's got some oil left in it. And uh, in Trinidad, it just ends up going out to the environment. Um, and uh, it's kind of crazy. It, it makes absolutely no sense. So we're actually the first company on the island uh, that's starting to capture that water and re-inject it back into the reservoir. And by 2019, um, I want all of our facilities to, to have that. So we'll have zero emissions. Um, I think it's really something that's, that's really exciting for us to take a look at. There's another side of it too. When you put water back in, you increase the pressure in the reservoir and you get more oil out. So there is a benefit of us doing it, but uh, on the other side, it's pretty good. The other thing is there's, um, uh, the manpower in Trinidad is fantastic. It's been 100 years producing oil, so their universities are all set up. They've trained engineers, they've trained geologists and uh, accounting people that do the oil and gas business. Um, of the 98 employees we have in Trinidad, we have one expat, um, and he's actually not really an expat. He, we sent him down there to do a job, and he <coughs> fell in love with our uh, HSE lady, and he's never come back. So, so he's more a local than, than most of us. But, um, and then we've got 11, uh, 11 in, the, uh, in the head office. So it's, it's pretty lean on that point of view, and it's just it works fantastic. The people there are great, and it's, it's been great to be part of that community. So as far as the uh, sort of corporate snapshot, um, basically where we're at, market cap today is about $25 million. Uh, we've got 103 million shares outstanding. And the highlights on this particular slide are the going public on June 26th when we listed on AIM. Um, when I, on June the, or July the 11th, we merged the stocks so the AIM and the Toronto stocks could trade together. And then we saw a big uptick in, in October. And what we did is we put out the drilling results of the first four wells. Uh, we started to market a little bit more, uh, did a couple of uh, retail presentations, uh, Shore Capital and GMP uh, started to publish on the story. And I think what everybody found fairly quickly is the stock moved up, especially when we compared it to our peer groups. If we compare it to Columbus, Trinity or Range, uh, we still traded a deep discount uh, to all three of those. And I think the reason is we're the new guys. Um, we got to show everybody what we're doing. I think the first four wells were a really good indicator. Uh, and the next little while is going to continue to, to push that along. So the other thing that's happened is liquidity has shifted from Toronto. And when I say shifted, that's a loose term because we, we hardly even traded on Toronto anymore. Um, we were trading maybe 50, 60,000 shares a day. Since we've done the AIM listing, we've traded 60 million shares on AIM. So it's given us great liquidity and uh, it's worked out really, really well. I think the other point is these micro caps, international micro caps, AIM understands them better. Uh, people here are more comfortable with Trinidad than they are in Toronto. Uh, they're more comfortable with international companies generally um, and our peer groups here. So it just was a natural fit for us to move here and it's worked out really well. So that's the summary. I'm not going uh, to read through all of this because you basically, um, you, you basi I basically covered it off. The only other thing that I would say is you'll notice when you look at the map, that there's a very large block of land on the east side of the island uh, that we picked up a couple of years ago. It doesn't have any production on it, but that's going to be our exploration block for 2019 and 2020. Um, we think that everything that we have just continues onto the eastern part of the island. Uh, there was a bunch of wells drilled back the, uh, by Texaco and Chevron back in the 1950s, 1960s that encountered oil, but it was just too low rates for for what they were looking for. We're just gonna go back in and redrill a bunch of those wells. So um, it's an exciting block. Uh, of the three companies that I've had, and, and they've all been north of hundreds of millions of dollars in market cap, this is by far the company that has the biggest oil reserves underneath our land. Um, it's almost a billion barrels of, of oil under the lands that we hold. So we just gotta squeeze the oil out of it. 
And I, I must say that being paid Brent price, working in an environment right now that's very friendly to the oil and gas environment, and a government that is encouraging uh, exploration and production, is a, it's a great place to be right now. And I think that's why you've seen Columbus, Trinity, Range all move up dramatically over the last year. I think when they get compared to the rest of the world, it is a very exciting place to be. So on that note, um, what I would do is turn it over to questions, Roland, and, uh, and go from there. And raise the hand, somebody. At the back there, please, Chris. Uh, would you explain the um, taxation, the royalty system in uh, Trinidad and the extent to which I believe that the government may be proposing to change it? They've got plans at the moment, or they're talking about it. Could you explain it as it is and as it might be? In words of one syllable. <laughs> sure, that, that is, okay. We could have a day seminar by Norton Rose on this, but, but um, what they have is they have two things. They have a royalty and they have taxes. Um, and the royalties are roughly 12.5%, uh, and that goes to the crown. And then they have a tax system that is made up of two parts. There's what we would refer to generally as a corporate tax, and that, that corporate tax can be anywhere up to 50%. So it's pretty onerous uh, as a bear tax. However, any wells that you drill, um, you can deduct 100% of the cost against your taxes payable. So in our particular case, when we run out our model, we don't pay any corporate tax for 15 years, just because the money we've spent and the money we're gonna spend. Then they've got this absolutely crazy tax that's, that they refer to as a windfall tax, and it's an 18% tax comes right off the top when oil's over $50 a barrel. Below $50 a barrel, it's zero. Over $50 a barrel, it's, eight, it's 18%. Um, so that's, that's a killer. Uh, where we are right now is a terrible place to be. Well, not a terrible place to be, but it's 60 plus dollars a barrel. You're actually, you know, you're paying that tax, whereas you wouldn't pay it under $50 a barrel. But because of our tax pools that we've got, it's, it's not too onerous. But, but that's the system as it sits today. What they proposed, um, they, they got the IMF to come in uh, a couple of years ago and got five of us together on a panel. So there's Touchstone, Shell, BP, uh, Massey, and um, EOG. And um, what they want to do is make the new tax a profit tax. So what you'd be able to do is you make money, how much did it cost you to make it, and then you'll pay tax on the difference, which is how as Tom will be able to attest. That's how everything else is done around the world. That's, that would make it sense. They've talked about implementing that for a year and a half. Um, and in the budget in September, they said they were gonna do it by the end of the year. Unfortunately, I forgot to ask the minister which year he was talking about. Um, so I don't think it's gonna happen this year. Uh, I just don't think there's a political will. They need the money. The country's not doing very well. I think they'll leave the system in place. Having said that, if it does happen, um, the three biggest companies that will benefit from that will be Touchstone, will be Trinity, and will be Columbus with our onshore production because we have the highest tax rates, we have the highest burdens. And what they're trying to do is shift a bunch of those taxes off of the onshore producers into the offshore producers that are in the gas business. If they're successful, it'll be wonderful for us. We haven't built that anywhere into any of our, our numbers or the presentation. Follow-up question? If it's on profit, will it? I think this yeah. Is, is yeah. this on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it is on profit, uh, will you be able to have write-offs, or will that not apply? So what they're talking about is that you'd still have your write-offs, you'd still have your 100% deductions, but they'd put a minimum 10% tax in. So no matter how big your deductions were, you would still still pay 10%. That seems reasonable. So whether they take that or not, I don't know, but we'll have to wait and see. There's a, all the big guys are pushing pretty hard. I mean, Shell and BP are, you know, they make up 35, their revenue makes up, or their taxes and royalties make up 35% of the GDP for the entire country from those two companies. So they've got a bigger stick than we do. So I think they'll be able to, to use it. Any other questions, please? Gentlemen here, please, please. Sir. Tax question. <laughs> For a thousand well portfolio, you've got quite a difference between your proven and your proven plus probable. So I was just wondering how much of that 2P is coming from water injection projects yet to be implemented versus um, performance of the 
existing producing reserves? Um, so we have no water flood uh, in, built into our, our engineering. Um, the only difference between 1P and 2P is the recovery factor of a given well. So all of our wells are done on material balance. So it's, uh, you know, what it produced in January, what it produced in June, the decline curve is drawn out and those are the reserves. Um, so what they do is they take a 90% a, a probability of what that well's gonna produce, that's your 1P number, and then the 50% probability of that same well is your 2P number. So all it is is an increase in recovery factor from a given well. Um, we have never done a resource calculation of water flood because quite frankly, if you start water flooding these fields and it works, and that's why we're paying close attention to what Range is doing and what Columbus is doing. I mean, you're talking about numbers that take that 20 million barrels of reserves to something that's 100 million barrels, right? Uh, you go from 8% recovery factor to 35% recovery factor. Um, it's just until you get that proven technology, you can't get there. That is the next stage for Trinidad, undoubtedly. If they go to EORs, uh, enhanced oil recoveries, um, uh, they, will get their, they will get their production back up so they fill their own refinery. Right now they do about 70,000 barrels a day. The refinery does 150. If they can get good EOR, enhanced oil recoveries in place, um, it'll be up to 150,000. I'm sorry, I'm going to ramble here for a minute. Better than the water floods would be if they could capture some of that CO2 from the methanol plant, from the ammonia plant, from the refinery, from the LNG. The, like the CO2 that goes out of this place, there's a reason all of those plants are on the west side because the wind just blows all that stuff over to Venezuela. Um, if they could capture all of that, put a pipeline in, and bring that CO2 down and start putting it into the reservoirs, it would be, it, it would be massive the amount of oil that they would recover. It would be billions of barrels of oil. Uh, on the island. So that's something that we're working together with um, all the other producers to try to get a common CO2 pipeline. It's not very far, it's like 15 miles of pipeline. Uh, you'd capture it and then put it down and you get all these CO2 credits from around the world too. It would be, uh, it'd be a wonderful project but um, I think that's a better chance than the water flood uh, for me. Thank you. Any other questions please? You mentioned on the listing that you were operating, your price was at a discount to your peer group because you're the new guys. Um, and I think the current price, is it 23 cents, 24, 25, there or thereabouts? Yeah, we're 13p roughly. What do you think, if you were at the same, if you were at par with a peer group, what would that put you at, would you say? Well, we, we traded about uh, four times less than what Columbus is at, so I don't know what that, that takes you to 60, roughly 60p. But I think they've got some other plans they've talked about. You know, they've talked about uh, Colombia and Suriname, and so there's some other, other positive things, I think, intangibles. Um, I think it's a better comparison if you just took it based on what Trinity's doing. That's a pure Trinidad player. Okay. And they trade about three times uh, the multiple we do. So. And my other question was about um, the, kind of the target. And at the very start, you mentioned the previous companies you'd been with had got to 20,000 plus um, production a day. Again, in your mind, is that where you're looking to take this company? In my mind, I think what we really like to do is um, get to 5,000 barrels a day. And uh, I think this would make us a little unique on AIM, but at 5,000 barrels a day, you're generating more cash than you can actually reinvest into the country. So what we would really like to do is become a DIVCO um, at 5,000 barrels a day. That's the way the company's been set up from day one. It's set up actually as a Barbados sub. And the reason for that is we can take after-tax money out of Trinidad to Barbados and then distribute it um, tax-free on the dividend basis. So that's the plan. Um, and then I think what you do is you end up somewhere between five and 10,000 barrels a day and you'd be a DIVCO on, on AIM and away you go. And then based on adding 10 new wells every six months <coughs> on the current production levels you're achieving, from 1,500 barrels a day to 5,000, how far is that? In, 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 Six months, two years, 10 years, what, what's the time scale? So you get through 3,000 barrels a day in 2019, and that's where, I th that's where you actually start generating free cash flow. So you, when I say free cash flow, you've got more cash than your capital program. <coughs> um, so at that point, I think you would, you would look at taking the excess cash and dividending. Mm. Um, but I think when you get to a real sustainable model, uh, it's another year after that. It's 2020, 2020 2021. So it's really not... not not far in, in the grand scheme of these sorts no, of things. No, and I think there's some more consolidation opportunities on the island too. There are uh, not necessarily the companies I've, I've mentioned tonight, but there's a lot of little private companies that are three, 400 barrels a day here and there that, that are looking at opportunities. So, so we'll be looking at those as well. Okay. 
Time for one last one. Gentleman at the back again. More tax questions. <laughs> no, rising out of the things you've just said, does one take it therefore you will either become a dividend paying company or you'll expand slightly in Trinidad, but you won't be running around going into other uh, countries trying to drill for oil, spending your money? You know, the previous three companies that, or the previous two companies I did, we, we found an area, we became the best in the area, we became, uh, you know, the experts in the area, and I think it's exactly the same model. Um, you know, I, that's, uh, short answer is, yes, we're going to stay in Trinidad. Uh, we're not looking at offshore, we're not looking at anywhere else. Um, what we want to do is start to uh, eventually take as much cash as we can and fire it back to shareholders. That's what I want anyway. As a, as a big shareholder, it would be great to get a monthly check. On that note, Paul, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.